So we're in Romans. Romans is such an awesome book of the Bible. It seriously is. And some people call it the Romans Road. It's the sixth um, book of the New Testament. Not because it fell that way chronologically, it's just because it's the sixth one. Romans was written by the Apostle Paul, and we know that that some of Paul's teachings can be difficult, they can be tough to, to process, they can be tough to absorb, and even Peter talks about that a little bit. When Paul started out, and I'm going to recap a little bit on on Romans 1 as well, but a while back I was talking to Pastor Rod, and I said, you know, I kind of want to just start going through the Bible, you know, and literally taking it book by book, chapter by chapter, breaking it down, because so many people, they aren't going to read the Bible, you know, they aren't going to read it all the way through, so they find themselves just just knowing bits and pieces, you know, what they think the Bible says, what they think that they've heard other people say. But they don't, they don't dissect it all for themselves. And so I thought, you know, we should probably do that because we're the church and we're pastors, you know, and we're supposed to preach the Word of God. And don't get me wrong, I love praying and, and asking God, God, what do you want me to what do you want me to deliver this week? Or what do you want me to deliver coming up? And being able to hear from him and and do what it is that he's telling me to do and, and stuff. And I want to assure you, I do the exact same thing whenever we're reading it through the word and we're breaking it down for you. Because I promise you, there's no way, no way in the world that I could possibly deliver this word to you adequately without seeking him first not even remotely close so with romans romans is such a a deep book because it lays out the gospel in such an amazing way from the beginning to the end of it He lays it out, and he shows us that we all need a Savior, that all of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. None of us are righteous. It doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter what stage of life we're in. None of us are righteous. Our most righteous deeds are like filthy, nasty, disgusting rags. But only through the blood of Jesus Christ, only through accepting him and loving him, and believing that he is who he is, are we able to partake in the sacrifice and the suffering that he took, he bore our sin and shame on the cross to make the way for us, to make us righteous, because his blood covers us and makes our most wicked, horrible sins, makes us as pure and as white as snow. It says that he throws it as far as the east is from the west. That doesn't touch. That's how far away it is, you know. So, I know a lot of people get really offended at Romans chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3. It's easy to get offended at these if you don't listen all the way through. If you shut down because Paul says some things that is tough, and hard for you to accept and believe, if you shut down, you're not going to get to the redemption. You're not going to get to the forgiveness. You're not going to get to the gospel. Paul calls this my gospel. You're not going to get to the good news. The gospel means the good news. You're just going to hear the bad, and you're going to go, what? I'm not listening to that. Talk to the hand, right? I'm not listening to it. Guys, every one of us can get offended at what's in chapters 1, 2, and 3. 
All of us. We can all get offended at this. But if we do, we're going to stay in our offense. And we're not going to see the love of Jesus Christ through this. So please bear with me. Bear with me through this. As, as we lay it out for you in a way that's palatable for all of us. So sometimes we have to get creative in how we describe these things. I want to simplify it so that, that it's easy for anybody to understand. It's easy for anybody to be able to receive this word. Because for me, if I don't simplify it for me, how am I supposed to be able to simplify it for you? And if God wants me to present the word to you in a way that's going to renew your life, revive you, redeem you, restore you, make you into a place where, where you can receive his love for you, if I don't simplify it for me, how am I supposed to simplify it for you? So sometimes I have to, I have to work it around a little bit. And I found a, a uh, pastor... And he writes in, um, he wrote the, the app called Through the Word. His name is Chris Langham. And I was listening to him break down Romans. And the way that he started to break down Romans 1, 2, and 3 was basically like, like it was a court case. Like everybody was on trial. Like, like this court was getting ready to be in session. You got a summons to come to court. And you're showing up to court. And... He's breaking all this down for us, and I'll, I'll, I want to kind of lay it out similar to the way that he did because it helped me process it. It helped me to understand it a little bit more. So as we go along, you'll understand what I'm talking about. But I want to take it back to the very beginning of Romans and just kind of give you a set the stage, if you will. Paul said, he said that he's a bondservant of Jesus Christ, a bondservant, which means a slave that chose to stay. He chose to stay. He, he was able to be free, but he said, I don't, I don't want to go. I don't have any reason to leave. My master treats me better than I could treat myself out there. Why would I want to leave? And he says, okay, we'll put your ear up to the, up to the post. They drive a, an all through it. And now he's a bondservant. He says, I'm a bondservant to Jesus Christ. I could go do whatever I feel like, but I don't want to because what he has for me is better. He says that he's called to be an apostle. An apostle is somebody that's specifically sent by Jesus Christ himself. And Paul was on the road to Damascus. He saw Jesus. He heard Jesus. Jesus spoke to him face to face. You know, you guys all know the story. If you don't, please go back and read it in Acts. And he says, separated to the gospel of God. He has been called, literally, to bring the good news of Jesus to everybody. That's all, that, that's all his life is. Now he is a tent maker as well, so wherever he's going, he's not relying on funds from other people. He does take them if they, if they give them, but he doesn't rely on that all the time. But his main goal in life is to tell people about the good news of Jesus Christ. But let me tell you something. If you don't know that you need good news, what's good news to you? You aren't going to listen. If you feel like that you're right, you're good, everything's fine, I don't need anything, well, who cares about good news? It doesn't make any difference, right? If you feel like you're good enough without God... Why would you listen? So, that's why Romans 1, 2, and 3, he, he shows us the reasons why we need God. Paul was named Saul beforehand. But his life and his ministry, um, before, he, before he got into sharing the good news, the gospel... He was Saul, and he persecuted Christians. He was a Jew, one of the best trained Jews, and, and was outstanding in that. But then he met Jesus, 
And Jesus changed everything. Everything. You can, you can read about Paul's life as Saul and stuff and his conversion in the book of Acts, and I strongly recommend it. But most people believe that Romans was written while Paul was in the city of Corinth. So Paul traveled around all over the place telling people about Jesus and about what Jesus did for him, about how to be able to follow Jesus, who he is, you know, all that. Well, at this point, whenever he wrote this, they believed that he was in Corinth and he was on his way essentially to Rome. He knew that he was going to get to Rome. He knew that he was going to. But the whole time that he's going, everywhere he goes, people tell him, don't go to Rome. You're going to die there. And he's like, okay, thank you. I'll see you later. I'm going to Rome. You know, that's literally what he did. But um, when he was in Corinth, it was his third missionary journey. You can find that in Acts as well and, and in Romans um, 16, and he describes a little bit in there as well. But most commentators thought that this was written, think, do believe that this was written somewhere between 53 and 58 A.D., after Jesus died. Um, and Paul, on his way to Rome, like I said, he was warned time and time again, you're going to die if you go to Rome. So, the book of Romans, though, he's in Corinth, he's been warned, and he starts writing this stuff out. But I, I think from my study and my breakdown of this is that he was writing this, the book of Romans, to the people, the Christians in Rome, specifically because he's hearing all this stuff. If you go to Jerusalem, you're going to be persecuted. You know, Paul got, um, he got persecuted a lot, really, really badly, a lot. And so you can understand how he would think, well, I know God told me to go to Rome, but it seems like I might not make it. I've been shipwrecked a few times. You know, I get stoned everywhere I go. People have beat me so bad, you know, left me for dead. I've died. I've, you know, gone back into the city. And like, I might not make it, but I know I'm supposed to talk to the Christians in Rome. So I'm going to write this letter out that breaks everything down and send it to them. That way they'll have it. If I make it, I make it. If I don't, I don't, but I'm going to send it to them. So Romans, literally, is him trying to break everything down in a very clear and plain way that they can, all they can all understand and see what he's trying to do. So that's why Romans is so different than all the other letters um, or the epistles that, that Paul wrote, I think. The, you know, some of his other writings and his teachings, they, they focus more on the church and its challenges and its problems. You know, he's, he's literally talking about the challenges and problems that they have in those churches. Well, this one, man, it focuses more on God and on his great plan of redemption for them. A plan of redemption for Christians. A plan of redemption for Christians. Jesus was that redemption. Jesus did take our sins and our shame on the cross. He had already died at this point. He had already been crucified at this point. Isn't it interesting that we still have to walk out our salvation with fear and trembling? Isn't it interesting that, that just because Jesus died on the cross, and don't please don't hear me wrong, I'm not... I'm not saying just because, like, oh, well, that's it. No. What I'm saying is Jesus died on the cross for us to take our sin and our shame. But that doesn't mean that every single person is going to go to heaven now. There's a way to heaven. And it is through Jesus Christ by accepting what he did. And so Paul is having to lay all this stuff out because there are basically three different types of people. That, that Paul's really addressing here, and it's the wicked, it's the godless, and it's the religious. The wicked, the godless, and the religious. We're gonna, I'm going to try to break this down for you and show you how this works. But I want to, um, I want to read what Peter wrote 
about Paul in 2 Peter 3, 15 through 16. And if you guys know anything about Peter and Paul, they did butt heads once, maybe twice, um, because uh, they were being human. They were being humans. And so, but after all that, Peter writes this, and Peter is who Jesus is building his church on. So Peter is like, I'm, I'm Peter, <laughs> you know. I was Jesus' favorite. He chose me to build his church on. He let me walk on water. I got to go everywhere. I got to go up on the mountain and see him transfigure, you know, and I, I got to go do all those things. I'm the greatest. But then you have Paul, who was definitely the the greatest apostle that we see throughout the Word, wrote almost a third of the New, the New Testament, who Jesus met face to face and told him, you're going to have to suffer for me. It's such an interesting dynamic. I would love to be able to sit Peter and Paul down and be that third person in this conversation and just talk to them and listen to them and watch them interact with each other because their personalities are so dynamic. Well, this is what Peter says. He says, also our beloved brother, Paul. That's how Peter refers to, to Paul, the one that's writing Romans. Our beloved brother, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you as also in all of his epistles, in which some things are hard to understand. Paul says, or Peter is, is talking about Paul and says, listen, I understand some of the things that Paul writes is hard to understand. It's hard to get. He's straight up telling people that because he wants them to know just because it's hard to understand doesn't mean you shouldn't try. Doesn't mean you shouldn't make an effort to understand what Paul says. And even if you disagree with it, you should try to understand what he's saying. I would encourage all of you that anytime that you're reading something, especially in the Word of God, if you don't start out, which you should start out by asking the Holy Spirit, God, reveal to me what it is that you want me to get out of this word every time you pick this up, every time you pick it up, because it's God literally speaking to you through this. He's literally speaking to you. You get to hear what he's saying. You get to know his words through this, and you need to ask him to reveal it to you. To help you to understand what it means, the Holy Spirit will reveal all things to you, show you all things, even things that are hidden. So he wants to do that for you. Romans truly has life-changing truth, but it must be approached with effort and determination to understand what the Holy Spirit is trying to say through Paul. Like I said, there are things in here that may offend you or could potentially offend you, but please... Try to hear him out and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal his truth to you through this word. Paul started out, and Rod uh, touched on it again this morning in chapter 1, verse 16. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God for salvation. If this is the power of God for salvation, if the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God for salvation, then shouldn't we listen? Shouldn't we try to perceive? Shouldn't we try to process through it? And, and who are we to say, no, my understanding of the way it should be is, is more correct than what the word of God truly says. I know that, that people, people call this politically incorrect. This is politically incorrect in today's standards. Like Rod said, we get taken off of, of YouTube and all this junk. Who cares? Whatever. There's probably going to come a day where... Um, People will come and try to put me in prison for preaching the truth of this word. If they do, they do. Continue on. Continue on, whether I'm in chains or not. Most of what Paul wrote, he was in chains while he wrote it. 
you know? They couldn't believe that, that Peter was showing up to the front door because he was in, in prison, and they were pretty sure he was going to be killed the next morning. He was going to be killed the next morning. That's why God let him out. But you know what? He was still crucified upside down. Paul wrote all this good word while he was in prison, and he still got his head cut off in Rome. We can't not preach the truth of the word of God because of threats, because the enemy wants to stop us and shut us down. We can't not preach it, and we're not going to not preach it. And if we have to go to prison or we have to die for it, then we have to go to prison and die for it, whatever. That's just this earthly body. It's here today and it's gone tomorrow. This spirit, the soul, lasts forever. God says, don't fear those that can harm the body. Fear those that, that can take your soul. That's what matters. So we're going to teach the truth and preach it. But please listen all the way through. Because even the hard stuff that's in here, even things that maybe we disagree with, there's a purpose and a point for it. God says the righteous will see God. The righteous will enter the kingdom of heaven. We're not going to make ourselves righteous, guys. We're not. We're going to rely on the one that can make us righteous. Okay, so that's where we're going today. I'm going to present this somewhat as a court case, starting off. I am going to read through some of this. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm probably not the best reader. Brittany actually told me maybe I should have somebody else read it at one point. I'm like, that's a pretty good idea, but I don't have time for that today. So you guys are just going to have to deal with me. But is this biblically, politically correct? This is biblically correct. It stands on God's truth. But what I want to get at is why God says what he says. Why does he lay it out the way that he lays it out? And I think that all of you will love this. We first have to know that we need God's goodness. We have to know that we're sinners, saved by grace. So when Paul starts out and he just starts just nailing these things down, you'll notice that all through chapter 1, so we're in Romans, um, I'm going to just barely hit some stuff in chapter 1, but one thing that you'll notice is he's talking to the wicked, the godless, and then in chapter 2 he really gets to the religious people. And um, he's kind of covering everybody through here. So the wicked are the people that know that they're sinners but they're rebellious. They know what they're doing sin, but they're going to do it anyway. Has anybody ever done that other than me? I'm throwing it out. I, I've done it. Probably still do it. And these guys, if this is a court hearing, if this is a trial, and we've all been called to court, these guys, they're the ones that would go in and they would line up at the defendant's table. Right, because they've had charges brought against them. They're wicked. They know they're wicked. They know they're rebellious. Then you have the godless that come in. They might not look so bad on the outside, but they don't even believe that there's a God. They sit down in the back because they're going to watch this monkey court go on, and they're going to be like, yeah, this should be interesting. You know, They don't believe that there's even a God, right? They have no respect for, the, for what's going on, for the truth that's about to be revealed. They have no respect for the hearing, for the trial. They're the ones that have an excuse for everything, right? They're the ones that um, they, they can explain away just about anything. Like, oh, well, the earth was created because of uh, evolution. Evolution's why we have the earth. Evolution is why we have a son. And 
there are parts of evolution that are true, that are proven. But what's not true about evolution is that just bang, something, something exploded, and now all of a sudden we have people. We have an actual an earth, you know? I mean, that would be like, literally like a volcano exploding, and um, out from it comes some of the most amazing uh, fighter jets ever, the most capable, you know? But then somehow they also create little mini fighter jets that grow up into big fighter jets. Like, it just doesn't make any sense, you know? It literally just doesn't. But they try to stand on these excuses, right? But they go and they sit down at the back of the room just to watch this thing because they don't even know that the judge exists. They don't even believe that he exists. Well, then you have the religious people, right? Right? They're confident that they belong in the jury box. They're confident that I got summons here because I'm going to prove what everybody's done wrong. Because I know. Maybe they're even walking in eyeing the gavel, you know, ready to pass the judgment. They just, they're maybe not even going to go to the jury's box. They're like, you know what, I'm probably the judge here, actually. Out of all of us, if this is a, if Romans, and the way we're laying this out, if this is a court hearing, then take your seat wherever you feel that you should. I want to read Romans chapter 1, 16 through 17 real quick, just to, uh, just to touch base on how Paul starts this thing out, like he does... It does start out that he's a bond servant and all that stuff, and, and he's addressing Rome, but then the Christians in Rome. But then he gets down to chapter 16, and he says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek or the Gentile, your, your Bible might say. Now listen to this, though. It says, For in it... For in the good news, for in the gospel, and the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So before he even starts anything, he says, I'm not ashamed of telling you the truth, this good news, because here's why. Here's why. He's prefacing the stuff that I'm going to tell you. It's going to be difficult, but here's why I'm telling you. Because the righteous, it is the righteousness of God. It's revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. By faith. By faith. I think sometimes we have faith in the wrong thing. Sometimes we have faith in ourselves, in our own knowledge, in our own understanding of things, and what we think is true, what we think is fair, what we think we should be able to do or shouldn't be able to do. Just because you think you should be able to do something doesn't mean you can. I think I should be able to go out there and drive 130 miles an hour wherever I feel like going because I want to get there fast, and my car will do it. <laughs> but I shouldn't. Paul rolls straight into the wrath of God, though. He's telling people, <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you this. I'm not ashamed of the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed of the good news because it's by faith. And then he goes, boom, like drops a hammer straight on the wrath of God. He jumps straight into the wrath of God. He says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, not against you, against ungodliness. This isn't written against you. It's written against ungodliness. Don't take it personal. Who wants you to take it personal is Satan. 
unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Don't allow the truth. Unrighteousness doesn't let people see the truth. It tries to blind them and hide them and hide the truth. But let's look at what, what makes the wicked and the godless people real quick, okay? Let's, let's look at what, what he's talking about, who he starts to address here first in this court hearing. If Paul's the, the prosecutor, right? So he's getting up and he's, and he's starting to lay this out. What makes the wicked people and the godless people? And let's, if, you, if you're watching, if you're reading in Romans, he's all through Romans chapter 1, he's calling them them. He's saying them. This whole case that he's laying out, every single thing that he's saying is them, them, them. Them and they, okay? So he's reading, as he's listing this out, it says, in chapter 1, verse 19 through 24, I'll read it real quick. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them from his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and the divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. See that they, they are without excuse. Everyone's without excuse. You can see God in everything from the very beginning. If God was in the beginning whenever he created Adam and Eve and he created the Garden of Eden and he walked with them by the day and not, he was with them all the time. He even pre prepared loincloths for them after they sinned whenever he kicked them out of the garden. He was with them. And that was passed down from generation to generation. But people chose to move away. People chose to not be with God. That's what he's talking about here. They've, they've known from the very beginning. He says, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking. Here's the shift. Here's the shift why all of this is taking place. They became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. And exchanged, exchanged is one of the key points here. It's a key factor. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. They chose to trade God in a relationship with the Most High God, the one that created everything that created them to have relationship with him. They purposefully, willingly chose to trade that for images and idols. Anything that they wanted that looked different, they, you know, he lists out all these things, but what is, what's the first commandment? To have no other God before me. Have no other God before me. Love the Lord your God. And have no other God before me. But that's what they chose to do. These, these wicked and godless people. That's, it's a slippery slope. But it's a, it's, a, it's a slow fade. You make one little compromise here. And then it's okay to make this next little compromise here. And this next little compromise here. And, and you know you're not doing right. You know you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. But you, you're telling yourself. You're making up excuses for yourself. So that the, the things that you're falling into, the sins and the, all these things, that they're now okay. Because it makes you feel better whenever you tell yourself that it's okay. Even though it's not okay. It wasn't okay before. It's still not okay now. Then Paul lays out the consequences. God turns them over to the desires of their sinful acts. God turns them over. God turns them over. Do you think he wanted to turn them over? Do you think he wanted them to fall away? Do you think he wanted to let them go down that route, down that path? No. 
just like we don't want our own kids to, to make bad choices, to touch the stove when it's hot, to, you know, whatever. We don't want them to. But if they're so persistent that they're going to do it anyway, sometimes you just got to let them. And that's what he did. He just, he had to let them. And that's what happened here. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. Let's step into chapter 2. So Paul was talking to the the wicked people and the godless, right? And then as soon as you roll into chapter 2, well, actually, let me read the last verse of chapter 1. I think that's pretty, pretty paramount. Actually, before, I, I'm going to kick back a couple more uh, verses. In verse 28, it says, And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind, and to do what ought not be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. So it's easy for us to get, for us today, in today's day and age, to get caught on this this uh, uh, homosexuality part of the lust of the flesh, you know, men having desires to be with men and women and women and all that stuff. and And for us to... Focus on that so much. And honestly, that'll shut people down like right away right now. It will. So let's just go past that. I'm not saying that it's not wrong. I'm not saying that it's right either. Okay? But let's go past that and look at at these next couple verses. 29. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, Murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil. They invent evil. Disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Anybody ever seen Christmas Vacation with Chevy Chase? I probably shouldn't even bring it up. But it just reminds me, as he's going down hitting all these things, it just reminds me of when, <laughs> whenever he doesn't get his uh, his Christmas bonus and he just starts going off, calling the boss all kinds of things. You probably shouldn't go back and watch it right now, but, but uh, it is so hilarious. It kind of reminds me of this. It says, Though they know God's righteous decrees, that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Who do you think he's talking about here? They know God's righteous decrees. You know, we, we have this, this book broken up into chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, different verses. And Paul didn't write it like that. Okay, this was one, boom, one long thing. This this last one probably ought to be um, chapter 2, verse 1. Though they know God's righteous decrees, that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. So all in chapter 1, he was saying they, 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 they. Now right off in chapter 2, therefore you have no excuse. This, this was written to the Christians in Rome. This is written to me and you. To me and you. 
This is written to the religious as well. This is a warning just as much as it is anything. But it's a roadmap for righteousness. So he says, Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. Holy smokes. Hmm. In the way that we judge other people, we will be judged. We have to understand that Paul isn't saying that we don't help people, we don't show them, we don't love on them, we don't reveal God's truth to them. He's saying don't judge them. Because in judging them, you're bringing condemnation on yourself. You're going to be judged the same way. We're called to love people. Paul isn't loving them by not telling them that it's wrong. He's telling them things are wrong. They need to be made right. It's okay for us to do that. Because without repenting, without admitting that we're sinners, we can't be made right. We can't come into the full knowledge of God. We can't come into that love and compassion and mercy until we admit that we're sinners. So if we don't know what sin is, how are we going to confess it? How are we going to repent from our sin and come into that righteousness, right? So now he goes from they to you, and he just drops the hammer, boy, and he really does. But the whole point here is to get people right with God, to get them right with God, okay? You, therefore, have no excuse. It's almost like, it's kind of like a, a, a group of cancer patients all sitting around, pointing out each other's cancer, talking about it, it that it's worse than the other person's cancer. It's all cancer, and it's all going to kill you. <laughs> all right? Like, it's all cancer. The wages of sin is death. We want to focus on one over the other? That's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. So he says, We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. What does that practice mean? There's a difference between practicing something, living in it, and stumbling and falling every now and then into your struggles. Okay? The word says that a righteous man falls seven times and gets back up. There's a difference in living in it, dwelling in it, practicing it all the time, not wanting to, or versus not wanting to, right? So then he says, do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume the riches of his kindness and the forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impotent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. This this lays it out. It's his kindness that leads us to repentance. His kindness. We're supposed to look like him and be like him. We have to show his kindness to people that struggle with sin, even sin that's not like ours, sin that's maybe a little different than ours. If we don't, how are we supposed to look like him? And if we don't, maybe that wrath and that judgment is being stored up for us. He will render to each one according to his works, to those who by patience in doing well seek for glory and honor and immorality. Uh, Immortality, thank you. There's a huge difference in those two words. 
immortality. <laughs> he will give eternal life. He will give eternal life for, for those of us that seek those things. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey truth, but obey unrighteousness, they, there will be wrath and fury. Okay, so listen to that. For those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, self-seeking. Why would, we, why would we sit there and make excuses? Why would we sit there and try to find reasons to be able to stay in something that the word calls absolute sin? Because it's self-seeking. It's selfish desires. It's us wanting to be able to do whatever we want, however we want, whenever, wherever, whyever we want, because it's what we want, and we think that it's going to make us feel good. But we know that that's not true in our heart of hearts. In our heart of hearts, we know that that's not true. We cannot continue in something that God calls sin. And that's every bit of everything that we've been talking about. I think that it's interesting that he says, there will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek or also the Gentile. And you'll notice that that's something that Paul says through here a lot, the Jew first and then the Gentile, the Jew and then the Gentile, over and over and over the righteous, and the unrighteous. That's what that's supposed to mean. Okay? But he says that there will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil. The Jew first, the righteous, the person that thinks that they're right all the time, and the Gentile, the Greek, the sinner, the godless. It will be there. For, for both sides, for all of those sides. It'll be there for all those sides if you don't honor God. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, for the Jew first and then the Gentile, for God shows no partiality. Isn't that incredible? I love how incredible that is. God's judgment and the law. Guys, let me, let me break something down real quick. So the law was given truly to show us that we needed a Savior. The law was given to show that we're sinners. He knew that it was absolutely impossible to uphold the law without him. Without him, absolutely impossible. That's why it was given. And we talk about the Old Testament and we talk about the New Testament and the differences therein. Anytime that they're talking about the Word of God, they're talking about the Bible, they're talking about the Old Testament, they're talking about initially the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, then they're talking about the prophets, right? They're, they're quoting what we now call the Old Testament. The New Testament is what they're living right now, is what they were living out whenever they're writing this. That is the New Testament. And so they only had that to go on. And so it's so amazing and incredible whenever Paul and, and, and uh, the other writers of the New Testament start breaking down and revealing Christ and the, the plan of Jesus through all of the Old Testament. They're breaking it down and... and revealing all of that. And if you, we don't have time to get into it today, but if you go through and you start reading through the Word and you check in your little cliff notes, your side notes, if you're reading um, through your version app or the Blue Letter Bible or something on your, on your tablet, you can go in and it'll show you, you can literally click on it and it'll take you to the Old Testament reference and the Old Testament passage all the way through. Um, these New Testament scriptures. I strongly recommend that you guys do that. He goes on and he says, For all have sinned without the law. Um, for all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God but the doers of the law who will be justified. 
Let me say that again. It's not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. That's like, man, Nathan, you just said no one can uphold the law. No one can do it. That's absolutely correct. No one can without the, the power and the grace of Jesus Christ in their life and the gift of the Holy Spirit to help you through that. But where he says not just hearing the law or hearing it, guys, you can know the word. You can know this, this Bible word for word. You can know it word for word, but not make it part of you. You can know it and not live it out. You probably know tons of people that can quote Scripture all day long. I worked with a dude that could quote Scripture all day long. He absolutely did not live out <laughs> the, uh, the Word of God by any means, though. You know? Knowing it is totally different than living it. Okay? And Paul goes on and he talks about, um, talks about being circumcised and the, the, the how how circumcision is the, the look of, the outward appearance of being right by God. But you can be circumcised and still not have this relationship with God because that was part of the law. It was a big, big, big deal to the Jews. But he goes on and he talks about how it's not, it's not just about that. You can, you can be not circumcised. You can not look like, you know, following every every aspect of that and have the right pure heart and be right by God. It's about your heart. It's about um, submitting to his will and to his love for your life. If you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law, and if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law an embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? This is where he's laying into the religious. He's saying, you teach all these people all these things. Don't you teach yourself? Why do you teach them all this and you don't follow it? You're just as wrong as they are, if not more wrong. Technically more wrong. While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? Remember whenever Jesus said, if you even look at a woman with lust in your eyes, you've committed adultery. You who abhor, abhor idols, you who hate idols, do you rob temples? Do you take things for yourself? You who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Oh my goodness. That's a heavy weight. The name of God is blasphemed among the unbelievers because of you, you hypocrites, is what he's saying here. Whenever we read this, man, we've got to start looking at ourselves and say, man, do I steal? Do I commit adultery? Am I the reason that people are calling the church filled with a bunch of hypocrites? Is this me? God, purify me. Purify my heart. Help me, Lord, to honor you. For circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law, which means the entire law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. You were right. You did what you needed to do, but then you broke the law, so it's no good. doesn't make any difference. So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his, uncircumcised, his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision because he's doing what God has called him to do? He's doing what he's told him to do. Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and the written law and circumcision but break the law. 
Listen to this. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew or a religious, a holy person, is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. The person who loves God will keep his commands, will do what he's told, and will accept the forgiveness that Jesus bought and paid for. But when we go through our day-to-day lives, guys, we've got to remember that our lives are not our own. They were, our lives were bought and paid for at the most precious price. Greater love has no one than this, than he that lays his life down for his friends. And Jesus laid his life down for every single one of you and me. There's no higher price. He was the pure and spotless lamb. He took our sins and our shame. And all he requires of us is to accept it and love him and walk in it. That's the good news. Does anybody have any questions? I know that's kind of weird for a church service, right? But I feel like we're close enough family that we can ask some questions if we want to. If I can't answer it, hopefully Pastor Rod can. (laughs) Well, like Rod said, we're going to continue through the book of Romans. We're going to hit chapter 3 next time Rod preaches. Um, and uh, we'll just keep keep rolling through it. Man, it gets better and better and better. I'm hoping that I get um, some specific parts that I really want, uh, just because I really want to teach them. But anyhow, let's uh, let's pray and we'll we'll close. Um, are you gonna come up, Jesse? Yeah. Unmute Jesse's mic and her uh, keys, please. And um, she'll just play some nice, sweet music. And if anybody has prayer requests, if anybody needs prayer for anything, you know, you can come up or you can raise your hand. We'll come back and uh, pray over you, whatever. Um, if you need to leave, you can feel free to uh, to leave. But we're going to just enter into a time of, of worship and a time of prayer and just seeking God's face. Um, If you have kids, don't forget to pick them up. And um, we love you guys. So let's close in prayer real quick. Heavenly Father, thank you, God, that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Thank you, God, that you love us so much that you prepared a way for us to be able to enter into relationship and remain in relationship with you, God, that you've taken our sins away from us, Lord. And that all we have to do is trust and rely and love you, Lord. God, I pray that you will help all of us to realize that without you, we would be a hopeless mess, Lord. Help us to realize that our own wants and, and desires, if they don't line up with the word of God, that they are, they're not of you. They're not from you, Lord. And help us to Lay those aside. Help us to cast those cares and those burdens at your feet, at the foot of the cross, Lord, because that's where you've taken them. Help us to take on your your yoke and your burdens because they're light and they're easy and that's what you want for us. Lord, help us to just rest in your love. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will just be with us throughout this week, that you will reveal your word to us and your truth to us, God. If there's anything that we've talked about today that is, it is kind of binding anyone up, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will just reveal the truth to them in your love and in your loving kindness, Lord. If we've ever been somebody that has caused other people to feel condemnation in their own lives, God, I, I pray for forgiveness for that, Lord. Please forgive us, God, and help those people to forgive us as well, Lord. Help us to show them your love and your kindness as you lead them to repentance. 
Help us to walk out your plan and your will and your purpose, Lord. Help us to be obedient to you in everything we do, and we pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.